Welcome again to our Sunday morning service as we come time uh, for the preaching and uh, turn with me to feast uh, for feast. First Peter chapter three verse one. First Peter chapter three verse one, and we're going to read the first seven verses of this chapter, and then we'll get into our message. Uh, first Peter chapter three verse one. Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wise, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plating of the hair, and of wearing of gold, or of putting on of apparel. But let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price." For after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also, who trusted in God, adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. You see here, uh, holy women, holy women. If a woman is holy, she will be in subjection unto her husband. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. This, this verse right there rubs a lot of women the wrong way. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife, as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray you bless the message this morning. Uh, make, make Talk to us through your word, Father. Uh, change our hearts, change our attitudes towards you, O Lord God. Uh, we pray, God, that you teach us something this morning. And uh, preach to our souls, Lord God, and help us to enjoy this time, a uh, time of fellowship, a uh, uh, time uh, with the Lord. And I pray you grace us with your presence, Lord God, and may we uh, sense and understand and feel the work of the Holy Spirit in our midst this morning. We pray and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, uh, the context of this passage is uh, if a woman has a husband who is not saved, but, uh, but we're not going to focus on that this morning. But that's the context of the passage, because um, it says here, if any obey not the word. Now, it's not necessarily a husband who's not saved, but a husband who's not living right. Uh, typically, you find in the, in the family, and I've seen it time and time again, in married couples, when a husband is saved and the wife is saved, it's usually the wife, and it shouldn't be this way, but it's usually the wife who is the more spiritual one. It was the case when I was growing up, and my mother was the more spiritual one. She wanted, she's the one who wanted to go to church. Uh, it's not my that dad was a bad guy, he was saved, but she was the one who wanted to go to church, she's the one who wanted to read, she's the one who wanted to pray, she's the one who wanted to have family devotions, uh, she was the one, it looks like it was dragging my father all along. But that's not what we're going to preach about this morning, but I want to preach about spiritual authority. And I preached a message on spiritual authority about uh, six months or so ago, and uh, I want to... Uh, I felt that the Lord would have me preach a similar message this morning, so I want to make some comments uh, before I get into the message, just to give you a, a, an overview of what spiritual authority is. It is clear in the Bible that you and I have to admit, submit to the authorities that are all around us, that God has placed over us. Uh, the, spiritual, the, the question of spiritual authority is always an issue in society today. Uh, there's uh, students not wanting to obey the teachers, there's uh, citizens not wanting to obey the laws of the land, and they choose to obey which laws they want. We have our own leaders who feel that they're exempt from the law. Uh, we also have stories about pastors who abused their position uh, and left many uh, people wounded. And that's why some Christians today don't want, have, want to have nothing to do with church, because they attended churches where they had uh, what they call uh, Baptist popes. Uh, a pastor should not be uh, your pope. A pastor should be a, the overseer, someone who teaches the word, someone who preaches the word to you, someone who prays for you, and someone who's there to help you along life's uh, billows. Uh, but you should never, and, that, and I'm careful about this, I've always been careful, that uh, you don't want to become a pope, and you don't want to become a legalist. Now I teach the word of God, I teach the standards in the word of God, but I'm very careful not to tell you, you must do this or you must do that. Now there are certain standards, I will delineate those standards based on what my understanding of the word of God is, and I pray that the Holy Spirit will lead you and move you into, into adopting these standards as your, own, as your own convictions. But this morning, I wanted to remind ourselves of the importance of spiritual authority. Uh, this 
phrase, spiritual authority, rubs people the wrong way. Because um, the fact is, most people who are in authority today abuse the, that authority. And sometimes I have these discussions with my children, with my wife, as a pastor of this church. Uh, sometimes you feel like telling people, you must do this, you must do that, and you want to... You want to get angry at the people because they're not doing what God expects them to do. But I have to step back and say, well, it's not my job to get angry. It's my job just to tell the people what they're supposed to do. Then it's up to them to obey God according to their own free will. But the sad part is many people have abused their authority. And in today's society, we have many that refuse to submit and have little regard for authority. Scripture is clear that God is over all and he is a supreme judge and king. Uh, scripture is clear that Christ is the head of the church and not the Pope. Uh, scripture is clear that the pastor is the presiding elder of the local church and along with other elders of the church, he's supposed to rule the church of God. He's, supposed to, he's not supposed to lord it over them, but he's simply supposed to uh, rule with, with humility and sobriety. Uh, scripture is clear that the husband is the head of the home. I can hear all the tomatoes being thrown at me, all the eggs being thrown at me by the liberals. But the Bible is clear that the husband is the head of his home. Uh, scripture is clear that God has ordained government to secure our God-given rights and to punish the evildoers. Our rights do not come from government. They come from God. The government is there ordained by God. Now, I'm not one of those anarchists that believe we should have no government. I believe government is there to, because God put them there to protect us and to protect our rights and to punish the evil, evildoers. There are three institutions that God has ordained. The first is the home, next is government, and third is the church. God himself has ordained all, all these three institutions, and I'm against those Christians who, who are completely against government. We need government, but we need limited government. Uh, and, they, and these institutions were instituted in that order. They each have a divine purpose. And many problems develop when one institution tries to do the job of the other. When the government tries to get involved in church, they shouldn't. When church tries to get involved in the home, they, sh they shouldn't. Uh, the, home, the, the man is the head of his house. And you would hope that he would run his house according to the Bible. Uh, as, a, as a pastor, I don't have a right to meddle in your own personal affairs and how you run your house. My job is to teach you how you should run your house, and then how you run it is up to you. I'm supposed to teach you what the Bible says. And after that, I, it's not my job to come into your house and start telling you what to do. Uh, I don't believe that. I don't believe the Bible it gives me that authority. Uh, some pastors uh, have a differing opinion of that, but it's unscriptural. Uh, and again, problems develop when one of these institutions tries to meddle in the other's affair. Now, the church should not meddle in government's affairs. It does not mean that the church should not call it government. That's where we get mixed up. Uh, I don't tell the government how to run the country. All I tell them is what they're doing is right or wrong. That's, that's the job of the church. If the government is, is, giving, uh, is, is allowing women to kill their babies, the church has to step out and say, that is a sin, that is wrong. And then it's up to them to fix that problem. The government is allowing men to get married. The church is supposed to stand up and say, that, that is wrong, that's against the Bible. Now, if the government wants to keep doing that, they're going to, we're all going to suffer the consequences of their, of their, of their sin. That's what we haven't realized. We're, we're, all, uh, we're all in this together. And if our government strays, guess who's going to suffer? We are. We are. The devil has been very successful in America at jumbling the responsibilities of the home, the government, and the church. And the result is the breakdown of the home, a tyrannical government and a powerless church. That's what happens when you, uh, when you cross over into a domain that is not yours. And Annette had asked me what was I going to be preaching on. I mentioned to her that I'm going to I believe the Lord would have me preach something on spiritual authority. I said I preached this message six months ago and I didn't want to preach the same message. So uh, sometimes it's good to listen to your wife. She said maybe God wants you to focus on a particular area. And I said, uh, and I thought about it and that's what God was trying to tell me. He wanted me to preach a message on spiritual authority, but more precisely, authority in the home. And what I see today, and it's actually infiltrated the church, is that the modern woman does not want to submit to the authority of her husband. I see that a lot. And the reason for this is the devil. Mm -hmm. Eve rebelled against her husband when she listened to the serpent. 
The command to refrain from eating of the fruit of the tree of knowledge and good and evil is given to Eve, uh, to Adam, right? Not to Eve. God never told Eve, thou shalt not eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He told that to her husband. How did she find out from her husband? It was his job to tell her what God commanded him. And when she disobeyed her husband, she was disobeying God. And that's what women have not grasped today. Now, we're, we're all talking about in the context of the Lord. I'm not talking about an abusive husband, a husband who does not love God, a husband who's not, who's not serving God. That's not what I'm talking about. If your husband is a Christian and he's serving God, you are to obey him. And when you do not obey him, you're basically rebelling against God. In Genesis 2.15, the Bible says, And the Lord took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, not man, the man. Who is the man here? Adam. He commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. That command was given to God, to Adam, by God. God never gave that command to Eve. It was Adam's responsibility, and we know he did, because how else would have, how else would, have, would Eve have known that she was not supposed to eat the fruit? Adam told her. Adam sat down with his wife and said, Hey, wife, or Eve, or Mrs. Eve, or Mrs. Adam, whatever he called her, I don't know, but the Bible says he called her Eve. He said, God told us not to eat from this fruit, so we're not supposed to eat from this fruit. If a woman does not want to submit to her husband, she opens herself up to the spirit of rebellion. And this spirit, once it gets into the home, will affect the children. And sometimes I see some families, and I see the children, the children have gone astray, and I wonder, why are the children rebellious? And I'm talking about, again, I'm not talking about the lost people, I'm talking about Christians, I'm talking about Christian homes. Okay, I want to be clear. The lost people, of any Christ. Whatever the problems they have between husband, wife, and children, the first thing they need is Christ. And then you can deal with the rest of the problems. But I'm talking about in the context of a Christian home. And I wonder, and I see the children, I see, I always see two things that are common denominator. A, the husband is not serving God the way he's supposed to. And two, the wife has not submitted to her husband. And that spirit of rebellion falls and affects the children. I've always wondered, so why are some children in some families rebellious and some are not? And I had that answer, I had that question answered to me years ago when I went to a church in, uh, on the west side of the, of, the, of the state. I'm not going to give you any more details. But I went to that church for several years. And to this day, we are still friends with the pastor and the assistant pastor. Really close friends. What I observed was that all the kids grew up serving God. All the kids. The, the, the guy who was responsible for the school, uh, the, the, the pastor, the assistant pastor... Everybody involved in that ministry, all their children grew up, and we, we attended some of their weddings. We've known these kids when they were little. We saw them grow up in the, in the church, in the home. And all of them, all of them, bar none, are serving and following God today. And I said, why is it happening here with them, and it's not happening in other Christian families and churches? That's because the man was serving and following God in humility, and the wife was submitting unto her husband. Oftentimes, when Annette and I get to meet some couples and we get to know them, I'm telling you, as, as God is my witness, we don't gossip, but we, we know quickly when the wife is not submissive to her husband. It doesn't take long for us to figure out that this woman is not submitting to her husband. It, we, we just see it. It's, it's, to us, it's black and white. And what I'm saying this morning will rub many of you the wrong way. But I have to warn you, the devil is trying to destroy your family. And he will try with the children, and if you'll try with the wife, and he'll try with the husband. Now, I'm not picking on wives today, I'm not picking on anyone today, I'm picking on everyone today. But the devil is going to try to destroy your family. He's going to try to get you through your children, and he's going to try to get you through your wife, and he's going to try to get the family through you. One of the agendas of Hollywood has been pushed to us, is the dumbing down of dad. The dumbing down of dad. 
The dads are often portrayed as useless, lazy, incompetent, stupid, bumbling idiots, doofuses, selfish oafs, and even if dad has a good job at a home, he's forever making messes that must be straightened out by mom. They are shown as being incapable of taking care of their own children and inept at running their families. And this is how the typical commercial or sitcom personifies a man who happens to be a dad. The devil hates the dad. The doofus dad stereotype was introduced with characters such as Fred Flintstone, Dagwood Bumstead, and even Charlie Brown's monotone parents. There was a, I read an article years ago by John Tierney. Of, uh, he actually from the New York Times, and this is a liberal, liberal rag, we know that. And he wrote this, One evening after watching Homer Simpson wreck the family car at the monster truck rally and plunge on a skateboard into Springfield Gorge, my six-year-old son asked me, why are dads on TV so dumb? A six-year-old child was able to pick that up. There's an agenda of Hollywood to dumb down dad because if, if they look, if they make dad look like a doofus, like an idiot, like a dolt, then the wife is not going to respect him, nor the children. Now, if the, 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 the purpose behind this is when the kids are watching these shows, it's intended to create a doubt in their minds regarding that. And that's what, it, that's what Hollywood wants to do. They are a tool of the devil. Hollywood is a tool of the devil. And if they can cast dispersion over fathers, then they have succeeded in warping a young person's mind regarding God. And that's, if a child has the wrong view of dad, then the child is going to develop a wrong view of God. Negative general portrayals of fathers, husbands, and men in TV commercials and sitcoms continues to a decrease in men wanting to assume the roles in society. When a man is cons consistently attacked of being a dad, of being a father, of being a head of his household, he says, why do I, the children who are watching this, they say, why do I want to grow up and be a dad? In the Old Testament, the main responsibility of teaching God's word and precepts of the younger generation fell on the father. It does not mean that the mother was absolved of this responsibility, but the main responsibility fell on the father. It was the father who was tasked to teach his children about God. Deuteronomy 6 verse 7 says, And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. A dad's supposed to constantly teach his children about God. Constantly. Instead of teaching young men to want to be dads, Hollywood is teaching them to grow up and become women. Yep. And you're going to see, you're seeing now, a major push the last few years in, in, in school system, in the public school system, in our society, that they want young kids to question their identity. Society is really pushing the uh, the alphabet soup lifestyle, the LGBTQIABCDE, add, add a whole bunch of letters. They just keep adding letters because it's not enough. Everything that God has set up and ordained as proper in the scripture, the devil will try to subvert. God has set up the man to be the head of his house. Guess who's going to try to destroy that? The devil. God said in Genesis 1.27, So God created man in his image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. God created male and God created female. What does the devil want to do? He wants to switch the roles. He wants men to become women and he wants women to become men. Sure. Everything that the society is pushing is not because society, it's because of the devil. And it goes contrary to scripture. God says, male and female created them. He didn't say trans and trans created them. All this confusion in, in society today is by the devil. And when a kid gets into puberty, there's a little bit of confusion. And that's why mom and dad is there. It's okay, my daughter, it's okay, my son. I had when my, when my boys were, were getting into puberty, I had a talk with them. You're going to want to rebel. Your hormones are going to want to make you rebel. And let me tell you, if you try to rebel, you lose the battle. Every single boy. And my daughter, I talked to her too. Your hormones are going to come in and you're going, to want to, you're going to want to fight with mom. Many girls, when their hormones get king, what do they do? They want to fight with mom. Why? It's authority. It's all about authority. Genesis 5.2, again. Male and female created he them, 
and bless them. And don't miss this. Don't miss this. Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam, not Eve. And this is why a woman takes her husband's name. Why? Because God said it that way. God didn't call them Adam and Eve. He called them Adam, Mr. and Mrs. Adam, in the day they were created. I have a friend who used to say, if you get, if you get into a car accident and your car bursts in flames and you are burnt to a crisp, when they're going to identify you, they're going to look at your teeth, whether you're a man or a woman. Your own teeth. Did you know that? That, that your gender is stamped in your own teeth? You can lop off all the body parts you want. You can add all the body parts you want, but it doesn't change your chromosomes. Sorry. You have a, an X and X or an X and a Y. You can take all the hormones you want. You can grow all the facial hair you want. You can shave off all your hair, but it doesn't make a difference. You're either XX or XY. And if you have a genetic defect, you may have an extra chromosome, but we're not talking about that. That's not the, that's not the norm. That's a defect. We know that. The devil is attacking fathers, mothers, and children. And this is why the trans movement is directly, primarily, primarily directed at children. You ever wonder why? Because if the devil can get the children confused junk, then he's got, he's got them. Statistics are now coming out that all these trans people, after they have the gender surgery or they lop off body parts, 50% of them are, uh, uh, attempt to commit suicide. 50%. It's not normal. And we have to call it out. Protect your children. Again, Sorry. I've said this before. Uh, you may, you may, right now I'm going to say something that's probably going to upset you. Do not send your children to public school. Homeschool them if you can't. Everybody listening? Homeschool if you can. Send them to Christian school or private school as a second choice. Do not send them to public school. I, you may disagree with me, but, but, but I've seen... I've seen what it has done to my own nieces and nephews. My, my, my in-laws were uh, good Christians. They, they never missed church. They tried to raise this, their kids right. And now I see my nephews and nieces. Uh, what is, what, what, um, I can't tell you because it's family, but they're byproducts of the public school system. And I'm telling you, it is sad. It is sad. There's an often repeated joke that the husband is the head of the household, but the wife is the neck that turns the head. We all laugh at this because it's, it's closer to the truth than we want to admit, but the scripture tells you that fathers are called by God to exercise their authority in the home. And society hates this. If you're a woman and you're hearing this and it's rubbing you the wrong way, that means your heart is not right. Your husband is the head of the home. And the reason why he's the head of the home it's because God made him the head of the home. Right. And if you're a husband and you don't want to be the head of the home, man up and become the head of your home because God expects you to be the head of the home. The headship of the man has been affected by the fall. That is why earthly examples like the joke we just mentioned uh, cannot show us what God intended for us as husbands and fathers to do. We need to take a look at the scripture to guide us. Now, you may, you may wonder, I'm the head of the house. What am I supposed to do? It's all in here. It's all in this book. The pattern for you, how to be ahead of, the, of your house, is in the scripture. The home is the building block of any functioning society. Destroy the home and you destroy civilization. And that's what's being done in society today. And the devil begins first by undermining the authority of the man. The Bible is clear. If the man is the head of the house, the man is the head of the house. The man is the head of the house. You can dance around this issue if you want. You can say it's not politically correct. It doesn't matter because God said the man is the head of the house. Make no mistake. If you as a woman try to usurp authority of your own husband, you will not have a peaceful home. You will have an emasculated husband and you will be a screaming banshee. Yep. That's what happens in the homes when the wife tries to take authority over her husband. Now, we have to keep in mind that many men take this headship role and pervert it. Bless God, woman, I am the house, I'm the head of the house, and you can do what I tell you, right? Is that what the Bible teaches? No. The Bible doesn't teach because you're the head of the house, you have to walk around barking orders and making everybody feel like they're walking on eggshells and feeling your wrath if they don't, if they don't do as you say. They never tell you that the man, the, 
if because the man is the head of the house, he has to be a Christ-like example. He has to raise his children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And he has to love his wife as Christ loved the church. One pastor was talking about his experience regarding married couples and he said this. And I heard this decades ago on the radio and I never forgot it. He said, I've never met a woman come to my office and say, I want to leave my husband because he often brings me flowers. He remembers anniversary. He remembers my birthday. He provides for me and the kids. He's always gentle with the kids. He's loving. He's kind. He always comes home right after work. He takes us to church. He takes me out to date night. He finds a babysitter once in a while so I can have the day off. I know he loves me so much. He's never been unfaithful. And I want a divorce. So I've never seen that. I've never seen that. Every institution that God has ordained has a head. The church has a head, which is Jesus Christ. The government has a head, and sometimes they act like they have no head. But, uh, but there is someone responsible. And families must have a head. Now, who is in charge in your home? Who wears the pants in your home? Healthy families need a structure of authority. Our children need to submit to mom and dad, and the woman has to submit to her husband. That's how God has set it up. And the reason why God has set it up, because he understands there must be authority. Just like he is an authority, there must be an authority. God is interested in the well-being of families, and he calls us to be accountable to one another in society and in home. It is God who has established this hierarchy, not me, not you, and definitely not the government. Even at home, parents are never so above the law that they can behave, they can behave any way they choose. Uh, even husbands, even though they're head of the house, they have to follow God's rules. Right. Ultimately, they're responsible to God. It is important to note that when a God tells a woman to submit to her husband, it's not like the obedience of a child. Many men believe that a submissive wife is to act like a child. That's not true. This is not what God expects. Uh, submission is different to obedience. It is voluntary, just as your submission to God's authority is voluntary. As a Christian, God has given you free will. And the reason why I know God has given you free will is because you will reflect, examine yourself, and see if you're doing everything that God has asked you to do. And if you answer no to that question, then that answers the question that you have free will. Right. When you fall in love with God, you will have no problems submitting to Him. When a Christian wraps his arms around his wife and says, I love you more than anything in this world, and shows it by his conduct, a woman would have an easy time submitting to such a man. I keep hearing about couples wanting marriage counseling, wanting marital advice, and I wonder sometimes why. I know the answer. The answer is because they've stopped loving God, and they start living in the flesh. And if a husband and a wife start living in the flesh, it won't be long when we'll be at each other's throats. You know the reason why your wife snaps at you? Because her relationship with God is not where it should be. Do you know the reason why you snap at your wife and your children? Because your relationship with God is not where it should be. In, in marriage, there are three planes. There's the physical plane, there is the mental plane or psychological plane, and then there is the spiritual plane. But the physical plane translates into intimate relations, and that's very important in a marriage. The Bible tells you to cons consummate your marriage. Because the Bible says if a husband and wife are not intimate, the devil will come in. That's right. Someone said the source of all marriage issues is intimacy. Once you've become disconnected in that manner, in that fashion, arguments surface like a fat person at a salad buffet on January 1st. Some of you will get that. What happens on January 1st? Everybody wants to lose weight. So they all go to the salad buffet. Anyways, the second is the mental plane or the psychological plane. That means that you and your wife must work out life's problems together. And you also must develop common interests. I enjoy weight training. I really do. I've been weight training since I was, I was 15 years old. I love pushing weights. I don't know what it is about getting behind that barbell and just uh, struggling and I don't know what it is, I just enjoy it. So what does my wife do? She trains with me. And my wife likes gardening, so what do we do? We build growing beds in the backyard. 
You cannot go out fishing with your buddies every weekend and leave your wife at home. Likewise, the wife cannot go shopping every weekend and leave her husband at home. This won't last. It won't work. Husbands and wives need to do things together. They need to spend time together. And thirdly, it's spiritual. As a spouse, it is your responsibility to get closer to your Savior. Your husband, get closer to Christ. Your wife, get closer to Christ. And when you get closer to Christ, you will by default get closer to your spouse. Some preacher years ago explained the marriage relationship as a triangle. At the bottom point, you have the husband and the wife. and the top point, you have Christ. Now imagine this triangle has all equal sides. I'm not making an Illuminati sign, I'm just making a, a triangle. But as you get closer to Christ, what happens to these two points? Husband is here, wife is here, and imagine Christ is there. As you get closer to Christ, what happens? You see that? By default, you will get closer to each other. And the reason why you can't get close to your spouse is because you're not getting close to your Savior. One thing that couples don't do nowadays is pray together. And don't confess this fault, but when's the last time you and your wife prayed together? 1 Peter 3, 7 says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. This is spiritually speaking, not physically. And as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Peter assumes that a husband and wife are praying together. When the Bible says that wives are submit to their husbands, this has to do with things that are not contrary to Scripture. If you ask, uh, <clears throat> if you ask, if your husband asks you to commit a robbery with him, are you supposed to do it? No. When the when the Bible says to a woman she's supposed to submit to her husband, it's supposed to do with the things of God. Things that are scriptural. Uh, if your husband tells you to do something that's not scriptural. Being submissive to him does not mean that you do what he tells you to do if it's contrary to God's will. You obey your God first and your husband second. God never commanded a woman to engage in sinful or questionable activities that would cause her to obey, to disobey her Lord. Yeah. And before I continue on to my next point, I want to admonish the men who are listening to take that which belongs to you. God has given you spiritual authority of your home. Take it. Do not give it up. Do not give it up to anyone. It's your home. You're responsible for it. I remember having a discussion with a man whose wife was not saved and they had little children. He wanted to go to church, but his wife didn't want to. I advised him that regardless of whether your wife wants to attend church or not, you need to attend church. You need to show an example of what a Christian man is in the home. You need to get up and get your kids ready and go take your kids to church, regardless of whether your wife wants to come. I hate to tell you, this man is still not in church today. Yeah. He doesn't take his kids to church. He doesn't go to church himself. What kind of example is he showing to his unsaved wife? If she looks at him and he says, I'm a Christian, does she really believe his Christianity is serious? She doesn't believe it. Your wife may not want to get saved, but if you do that which is right, your children will eventually come to the Lord, and perhaps the Lord will use them to bring your wife to the Lord. Have you ever thought about that, old man? How many men I know have neglected the things of God and they do not realize it now, but it could mean the difference of losing your wife or your spouse for all eternity. It goes both ways. It goes both ways. In our text, Peter gives us the example of Abraham and Sarah and how Sarah called her husband Lord. A while ago before I got married, myself and a group of other singles went out to eat at a restaurant. Oh. You know, we were all young, we all, we all wanted the Lord's will in our lives, and we hang out with each other, perhaps maybe the Lord will, would uh, bring one of us together. But uh, we all went out to eat, and uh, we were also joined by a few young couples. Uh, they were not much older than us, but uh, probably around the same age, but they were already married. And I remember having a conversation with a young lady at the table that was sitting next to me, and she happened to be, to be married, and she made some not-so-flattering comment, comments about her husband. And I, and, I, and I reminded her about Sarah calling her husband Lord. And she looked at me and said, there's no way I'm calling my husband Lord. In other words, she had very little respect for her husband. And I thought to myself, what a shame. Such a young lady. She's going to have to live with this man the rest of her life. They've been barely married for some time and, she's already ha and she already has no respect for him. 
Sarah had no problems calling her husband. Now, I'm not saying that as a wife you should go around calling your husband Lord. That's not what I'm saying. But Paul, Peter says that Sarah called her husband Lord. And the reason why she did that is because she, I believe she deeply loved her husband and she deeply respected him. Listen to what Abraham had to say about what God had to say about Abraham in Genesis 18, 19. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken. Notice what it says. Abraham is going to command his children and his household. You know what that means? That as the head of the home, you have to command your children and your wife to obey God. It's your responsibility. Don't let the devil take that away from you. This is one important requirement for you to fulfill as a man. You have to take the authority in your home that God has given you. Do not give it to anyone. Do not give it to the devil. Do not give it to your wife. Do not give it to the neighbors. Do not give it to your parents. It belongs to you. God has given it to you. You are the head of your home, not because you have the highest intelligence or the most degrees. You are there by divine appointment. So you have to stand up and take your authority. Don't let the devil put you down. You tell your children what is expected of them. They are your children living under your roof, and therefore they have to abide by your rules. Likewise with your wife. You tell her how the house should be run, and that your family will serve God, and that she needs to follow you. Being a leader does not mean to do what you want to do all the time. You will listen to your wife's suggestions. You will hear her out. You won't be afraid to admit when you're wrong. You'll seek her advice. You'll talk with her. You will, you, you will work out life's problems together. Being the head of the house doesn't mean you go around stepping on your wife as a rat, as a rug. That's not what it is. That's right. Abraham was a man who was not afraid to command his children and his household to keep the way of the Lord. Someone said we need legitimate, tender-hearted, unapologetic, fatherly authority in the home. Being the head of your house doesn't mean you go around barking orders. doesn't mean abusing your power. doesn't mean uh, hitting everybody around you. It does not mean that. A father who is the head of the house knows the Bible. He loves the Lord and has surrendered, surrendered himself to Christ and, does, and never apologizes for being the head of his house. My wife knows that I am the head of the house. My children know that I am the head of this house. I don't lord it over them. I don't abuse them. I don't mistreat them. But they know that the, the, buck, stop, the buck stops with me. That God has made me the head of this house. And therefore, I must follow God. And I must do what God has told me to do. So, all this is great, you say. But what happens if my wife does not submit to me? What happens if my wife challenges my authority? What do I do? It is true that, yes, the husband is the head of the home. But if the wife does not submit, what do you do? Do you kick her out? Do you throw her out, do you throw her out with the bathwater? What do you do? Amos 3.3 says, Can two walk together except they be agreed? The first piece of advice I'm going to give you is if you yourself, if you yourself has, have not surrendered to Christ and not committed to Christ, how then do you expect your wife to submit to you and your children? That's right. Make sure that you as a man are doing all that God expects from you and all that God requires from you. Make sure you examine yourself and say, am I doing all the things that God wants me to do? Am I devoted to my God? Am I serving my God? Am I obeying my God? Have I submitted to my Savior? And once, you, once you're at that point, then you can begin to petition and ask God for help to get your wife to the place that she needs to be. Someone gave the following suggestions to help your wife submit to you. First, treat your wife with respect. Make sure she knows that you love her, that you appreciate her, and that you value her. Second, Never demand respect. You must earn it. If you have to raise your voice to bully your wife, you head it in the wrong direction. Be a servant leader. Lead by serving, helping around the house. And don't expect your wife to do everything, especially if she has a job. Always put her needs first. That's number four. Your friend's career or hobby should never have a higher priority than your wife. Number five, always follow through with your promises. You tell your wife you're going to do something, do it. Don't use the excuse, I forgot or I'll get around to it. Number six, 
and make sure you are serving God. We mentioned that before. God is the one who can and will change your wife's heart through your conduct. Peter says that about the wife. It goes both ways. Number seven, pray for your wife. Make it a matter of prayer. Once a husband has grabbed these points, it will be smooth sailing. Remember, your wife has been designed by God to respond to you. One preacher gave the following illustration. The moon can only reflect the light it receives from the sun. The husband in the marriage is like the sun, and the wife is like the moon. The moon reflects the sun as the wife reflects her husband. Never forget that. Your wife has been designed by God to respond to you. Another man said, if I want to know what type of man he is, all I have to do is ask his wife. You've heard of the saying, a happy wife makes a happy life? That's true. One man said, I can choose to be right, or I can choose to be happy, and I'd rather choose to be happy. Sadly, many wives use their emotions and their moodiness as a way to manipulate their husbands. I remember when I was younger, I made, I made this clear to my wife. Even as a young man, I knew what I, I, knew what I had to do. I said, uh, your tears will never run me. I, was, I, I, was, I felt I was cruel, but I had to make sure. I told her, your tears will never run me. Now, if your wife is crying, you have to find out why she's crying. If she's crying to try to manipulate her, don't fall for it. you gotta be, you got to be a man. I don't know what to tell you, but you have to be a man. But as a wife, <clears throat> if you're happy in the, in, as a wife, then your home is going to be happy. The Bible warns us against a, a woman who is not happy. Proverbs 27, 15 says, A continual dropping in a very rainy day and a contentious woman are alike. Proverbs 21, 9 says, It is better to dwell in the corner of the housetop than with a brawling woman in a white house. And if your wife's not happy, ask yourself why. You're the head of the house. You have to help her. You have to find out, why is your wife not happy? What are you doing? Perhaps maybe you're doing something to cause her to be happy. I kid, I kid with my wife sometimes. I say, Am I making your life miserable? <laughs> That's a joke. When I see her and she's not happy, I said, am I making your life miserable? What am I doing wrong? I don't think she appreciates that joke, but sometimes I kid with her that way. But wives have the power to transform their homes from a vortex of negativity into a refuge of joy. And that's the spirit that Sarah had. And that's why Sarah was able to say to call her husband Lord. She loved him and she respected him, and she had no problems calling him Lord. And as, as it goes both ways, as a husband, you honor your wife's wishes, and as a wife, you honor your husband's wishes. And you do this by listening to them attentively, by, by listening to them with your mind being fully engaged at what you're saying. Sometimes I've, I've, uh, me and my wife have an agreement that if I'm doing something, if I'm listening to something, if I'm engaged in some activity, uh, she can't just start talking to me. We've had this agreement for years. Is that first, you must get my attention. And I promise you, if you seek my attention, I will give it to you. But don't start talking. And sometimes she starts talking, and uh, a few minutes later, I said, are you talking to me? And I've told her, get my attention. And as soon as you get my attention, I promise I will listen to you. you got to respect each other's wishes. You gotta listen not only with your ears, but also with your heart and with your brain. As sometimes I accuse my children of not caring because we talk to them, we give them commands, and 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 and, and we told them, have not I told, have I not explained this to you? Have I not, uh, have I not told you this? How many times have I told you this? I don't remember. I don't know. And then I accuse them of not caring because I I teach them if you care, you would listen not only with your ears, but you would listen with your heart and you would listen with your brain. You would hang on every word that comes out of the person's mouth, especially if you know that you have an issue with paying attention. And husbands, we're guilty of that. Sometimes our wives talk to us and, uh, and we don't know what they're saying. Uh, if we care enough, we'd be engaged with our minds and with our hearts. If my spouse is important to me, I want to hear what she has to say. It's not easy, but it needs to be done. Uh, husbands are the best people to share secrets with. They'll never tell anyone because they aren't even listening. It shouldn't be that way though. But the husband is the head of the house and he must take the helm in humility. In his own way he must submit to his wife. He does not, this does not mean uh, 
The, when the Bible talks about submission, it goes both ways. Yes, the husband is the head of the wife. She submits to her husband. And the Bible says, we are submit to one another. So there's also a, a, a co-submission here that the Bible requires of both husband and wife. That means when you recognize that you're head of the house, but that does that... that that does not mean that you belittle your wife. That, that does not mean that you treat her as someone lesser than you. You are partners in marriage. You are partners in Christ. But you're still the head of the house. As a husband, your concern and priority is to be the fulfillment of the needs of your wife. They should always take priority over your needs. Always. You have to be a servant leader. You have to lead by serving. You serve your children, you serve your wife, you serve your family. Jesus said he did not come to serve, to be served, but to serve. In Mark 10, 45, he says, For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. Now, Jesus was a servant leader. He never forced any of his disciples to follow him. Uh, he did choose 12 of them, but then again, they too had a, a free will to follow him. He chose 12, but did not want did not one betray him? And later on, Peter had to, uh, uh, Peter, Jesus had to shake him up and say, Peter, uh, why aren't you doing what I asked you to do? After the Lord uh, perished, uh, died on the cross, and after he rose from the dead, there was a time in Peter's life, he goes to the rest of the disciples, I'm going fishing. He wasn't following God. He said, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm done with this, I'm going fishing. And Christ had to come and say, Peter, do you love me? It was God who came and saw Peter and says, Peter, I don't want you to go fishing. I want you to follow me and serve me. We have to use Christ as an example. Marriage is not a 50-50 proposition. It's neither a 100 to 0 proposition. I've heard people say, you give 100% and don't worry about your spouse. That's not going to work. Marriage is 100-100. You give 100% and your spouse gives 100%. Otherwise, it's not going to work. God wants your marriage to be great. He's the one who actually created marriage. And He created it to be wonderful, to be a slice of heaven on earth. And this is why God likens the relationship between Christ and the church to the marriage relationship. You can make your marriage a little bit of heaven on earth by following God's design and structure. Obey God's plan, and you will reap the benefits. Ignore God's plan, and you will suffer the consequences. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, for your goodness. We thank you, Lord God, for your word. We thank you, Father, how things in your word are so black and white. Many times, Lord God, we seek help and assistance from sources other than your word. Instead of spending time in the word, studying it, reading it, finding the questions of life's problems in your word, we go elsewhere. We go to counselors, we go to self-help groups, we go to this, we go to... We go to on and on and on, but the last thing we do is follow the Word of God. We pray, Heavenly Father, you help us to take these, these things that you teach us in your Word and to apply them in our lives so that we can reap the benefits of a happy marriage and a happy life.